Welcome back to the morning show here on the Rise News. I am Adesua Omoruan. And I'm Rafa Yoseni. Now, politically, the use of WhatsApp is becoming increasingly sophisticated and very organized. Especially at the presidential level, where multiple overlapping WhatsApp groups were set up during the 2019 election by political organizations such as the Buhari Media Center and the Articulated Youth Force. Now, due to its low cost, encrypted messages, and the ability to easily share messages with both individuals and groups, Nigeria is said to be among 40 African countries where the use of WhatsApp is most popular. Yeah, not surprised. However, <laughs> released research findings by a UK Nigeria research team, uh, which examined the role of WhatsApp played in the 2019 election, revealed that WhatsApp both strengthens and undermines the Nigerian democracy. And thus, at the moment, WhatsApp is the most popular messaging app in Nigeria. Obviously, it's good. Well, we'll be having a discussion on this uh, with Jamie Hitchin uh, from our Abuja studios. Um, he's an independent researcher from Area Consulting uh, and in conjunction with Center for Democracy and Development. And they coordinated a study, um, you know, examining the role of WhatsApp in the 2019 general elections here mm. in Nigeria. But before we join Jamie in Abuja, uh, Rufai, WhatsApp, social media in general, mm. is becoming very influential in the way we live our lives and in election cycle even more important mm. uh, increasingly we're seeing african government who you know shut down social media during elections mm. most recently in benin it's been peculiar because when you look at the conventional it does not cover regulating laws. It doesn't also cover social media. So there's a bit of a challenge there. Challenge. So this morning I was going through the waste report and I'm, and I'm okay. sure that the waste report when they were writing it after the election in 2007, nobody would ever preempt that something like social media would change the dynamics of the report. Mm -hmm. Take for instance, uh, the current uh, case going on, and I know it's subject to Presidential one. Presidential mm -hmm. one. A lot of case has been raised as regards, you know, social media. Mm -hmm. There's some allegations made that it was seen on a certain website and mm -hmm. things like that. So it shows that it has come to stay. I think it was Chad recently that there was an uprising in the country and they banned the use of social media. The very first thing most African nations do pretty much when there's an uprising is to cut social media off. It's been used as a, as a form of organization across board. Mm -hmm. You know, WhatsApp, you know, Facebook, mm -hmm. the Arab Springs pretty much started on Facebook. Indeed. And, and that's the power of the social media, the coming together of a lot of people. Indeed. So I'm, I'm sure when we talk to Jamie about this, he's got a lot of insight for us. Well, Jamie Hitchin now joins us from our Borja studios again. And area consulting in conjunction with the center for democracy and development uh abuja coordinated the study of the role of whatsapp in the 2019 nigeria general elections hello jamie thank you for joining us on the show this morning uh, good morning good morning so can you give us the key findings uh, to your research what exactly did you find out yes well uh, i think the research that we've done, and we were focused mainly on uh, two states in Nigeria, Kano and Oyo State, and also uh, talking as well at the national level to uh, stakeholders here in Abuja. Um, we were trying to kind of understand a little bit about how people were using WhatsApp, both political parties, but also voters. Uh, and I think that what we've drawn is, is kind of four key findings from that research. And um, one is around the way that uh, social media is structured. Um, it is kind of formal yet also a little bit distant from formal political parties and quite informal and loose, loosely connected. So in many ways, uh, replicating the kind of uh, political structures that we see in Nigeria more broadly. Uh, and it's offered a space for younger people to kind of be more prominent, not necessarily context uh, coming online. So offline and online context are very much intertwined. So. The way that groups are formulated in Nigeria, for example, uh, are often representative of you know, family structures, religious structures, uh, alumni associations. And that can have a really important impact in terms of how information flows, as we know that rumors are not really anything new uh, in Nigeria or, any, to be fair, anywhere else in the world. And we've also kind of tried to uh, look a bit in detail at what kind of content is being shared and how that impacts on how people receive it. So in terms of video versus text versus uh, images, uh, versus also the language in which it's used and who the information comes from. We were trying to map these things out in a very kind of um, uh, introductory way, I think, 
Uh, and the final thing, of course, is to stress that uh, WhatsApp is also having some very positive impacts. And, and one of the main kind of outcomes of the report, I think, is to try and emphasize the kind of balancing act that needs to be struck. The, the kind of idea that uh, whilst WhatsApp can be a tool for spreading social, uh, false information across social media, um, it can also be an opportunity for greater accountability towards political parties, for greater engagement, for greater scrutiny of those processes. And so in the kind of uh, Catch-22 situation, WhatsApp can be the, the, the most likely spreader of false information, but also the, perhaps the best way to counter it. Uh, I, I, like you did say there, Jimmy, in a catch-22 situation, but, but we know there are many catch-22 situations uh, as regards to the use of this. Uh, can you just pretty much uh, highlight those probable catch-22 situations in the two states you examined? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that properly. Okay, so you said this can be used, you know, pretty much uh, spread good information and bad information at the same time. But I'm saying I'm going in detail to your research now. Uh, what were the findings? I mean, what were the instances, what were the case studies where this was used, you know, uh, spread good information and just spread pure propaganda? Yeah, um, so with the kind of structures that we're looking at in terms of um, political organization, what we found was uh, in Kano, perhaps it was uh, quite informal, but often young, kind of um, very digitally savvy, um, and some often politically connected individuals who would, some, in some cases, approach political uh, aspirants, in other cases, who would um, already have connections to that political party, but who are a bit distant from it, uh, offering kind of to promote um, that candidate uh, across their WhatsApp group. So that could both mean promoting in the sense of uh, encouraging people to go out to vote, uh, but that can also mean in, in creating stories that were false about their candidate, as in to make him look better, and it often is him in Nigeria, or to make the other candidate look worse. Um, so uh, one example uh, in Kano, for example, that I could give you was uh, we spoke to one consultant who was working for the, the PDP governor candidate. But again, we should say, when I say working for, uh, they're not kind of contracted or any kind of formal arrangement. They're often doing this in the expectation that maybe they will receive something in return at the end of the day. That they would, in an effort to try and boost the profile of the PDP candidate uh, in Kano, would be to take pictures at, at, at rallies where uh, their candidate was seen handing out scholarships and the opposition candidate, uh, Ganduje, was uh, seen as um, having thugs in, in his rallies, even though they told us that in both rallies these things were going on. But it was a question of kind of changing the optics and, and pushing narratives on social media. Uh, and I think that's what we uh, have seen uh, in OYO as well. Uh, there's this kind of fluidity uh, to the way that um, like propaganda is being used um, and political parties are very cautious about distancing themselves from it so that they are conscious of the need not to be involved in sharing of fake news but they're also cognizant of the fact that people are uh, working not necessarily for them but on their behalf and in an effort to support them in order to um, push forward you know false information um, and so that that's kind of the dichotomy that we've kind of been able to see in both in both states. Well, Jamie, how do we counter the negative impact of uh, social media when you see the likes of uh, vicious trolls, uh, false information, without undermining, you know, the power and the influence of social media in inclusiveness and democracy? Yeah, no, it's a very good question, and I think one that uh, is being grappled with all over the world, not just in Nigeria. Uh, and I think that the, one of the main kind of recommendations that we put forward in our report uh, is to really focus on uh, digital literacy and also to an extent political literacy. But digital literacy at lots of different levels. And I think that in the short term, targeted digital literacy can have a big impact. Uh, targeted in terms of uh, community leaders, for example, or uh, religious leaders who often have a, a big say and big amount of weight in the, in the communities in which they operate. So that's one kind of initial targeting. Then also looking at uh, if we can improve the kind of role that WhatsApp group administrators play. Uh, in non-political groups, you know, I'm sure that many of the viewers are in groups which are organized around workplace, 
Uh, they often have much more strictly enforced rules. It's whether those can be applied to other formats. And then also in the longer term, uh, we've kind of recommend that uh, the government should look to uh, start a kind of na nationwide digital literacy campaign, starting even kind of as early as secondary school, to give people uh, a sense of critical thinking and how they can engage with these platforms. Uh, because one of the findings of the survey work that we did in the two states, we surveyed about 1,000 people uh, across Kano and Oyo, or in Ibadan and Kano specifically, uh, about 83 or 84% of them said that sharing fake news was never justified. So there's a kind of normative belief that sharing fake news is wrong, but often I think that some of the challenges are that people aren't aware of things that are fake. It's very easy, for example, to take a picture that is an actual picture and then mislabel it, and then you kind of, it's very difficult to decipher whether that picture is true, whether the information is true, uh, and one of the things that WhatsApp really builds on is the, the intimacy of the platform. So the fact that you're receiving that information, often from friends and family, makes you more likely to believe it than anything else. All right, uh, Jamie, let's explore the concept of fake news. And, and I'll give a couple of instances and things very much we can do to spot fake news. Uh, if you remember, pr prior to the last elections, the vice president of the country and the vice presidential candidate of the APC did have, uh, have an helicopter accident in Kogi State. And, and the story that circulated uh, was another crash somewhere in Mali. And that was a video that circulated. It was, it was really circulated by WhatsApp. And a lot of people did to think uh, that was a crash until that story was gradually being debunked. How many cases and instances like that? How, how do we nip it in the bud? Yeah, and I mean, there have been lots of elections. So uh, the obvious one about the president um, being a, a clone from Sudan was, was, was very prevalent. Um, one of the things that we did in the, in the research was to, to ask the survey respondents to if they'd seen some of these national stories that were actually false. And on the whole, actually, what we found is that more often than not, <coughs> excuse me, the national kind of stories are not penetrating perhaps so much as you might think at the sub-national level. So less than 15% of people had seen the two stories that we asked them, uh, which was about uh, the um, APC administration trying to regulate uh, churches, for example, and then also a, a kind of uh, another one looking at whether Atiku was offering a package deal to Boko Haram um, to cede a bit of territory in Borno in exchange for a peace deal. Now, both of these were fact-checked by the Center for Democracy and Development as false, but both of which went quite viral around uh, networks, particularly in Abuja. Now, uh, what we found is that rumors at the kind of sub-national level so are perhaps much more prevalent at spreading, um, and obviously one of the challenges of tackling that in the short term is, is around, and there's been a lot of fact-checking initiatives. Uh, and what I would say about fact-checking is that uh, it can have an important role to play. I think perhaps it's very difficult at the moment for it to, to keep up with the fake news. If you like. There's so much false information online. And the, the importance of the source that I mentioned before is, is really cru key, crucial here because um, people are more likely to believe, say, uh, information they receive from their religious uh, individuals or the community leader than they are from uh, a perfectly reputable, but they don't know personally, uh, cross-checking or fact-checking information website. Uh, I think fact-checking, though, is important in that it can build up a kind of sense uh, of the importance of, of, of um, kind of critically analyzing all information that you receive to think, well, if I, is this true? Why could it be true? Why might it be false? Um, and, you know, it can really build a kind of general approach that can uh, improve uh, that environment. But it is uh, difficult. I, I think one thing to really stress is that you're, you're never going to get rid of false information on, on social media. We have rumors that exist uh, in our daily okay, lives. Okay, off, uh, hi, Jamie. Uh, if, if you can hear me, uh, Jamie, we'll, we'll quickly go for a break. We'll come back and we'll talk about this and even other issues when we come back from this quick commercial break. Uh, stay with us. Glad to have you back. You're still watching The Morning Show here on The Rise News. And Jamie Heaton is still in our Borgia studio. An independent researcher from Area Consulting um, carried out a study on WhatsApp and, uh, you know, the relationship in Nigeria's general elections in 2019, the influence, actually. Uh, Jamie, thank you for staying with us. Now, you carried out this research on two states in Nigeria, Kano and Oyo. Very interesting in two different uh, geopolitical zones of the country. Now, 
the power of social media is undeniable. However, one wonders what sort of influence it has on actual voting process because elections are not held online. Now, for all your states, all your states, um, the opposition party in the country took over that state at the governorship level. Um, but Kano State was retained by the ruling party, APC. I'm just wondering, did your research, you know, find out if WhatsApp or social media in general had any role to play in all of that in the actual voting process? Hmm. Yeah, and it's a, it's a very important question, uh, you know, the impact of WhatsApp. I think it's something that's uh, we would hope to do further research on in the future. It's, it's very difficult to say definitively that one thing that you read on WhatsApp changes someone's voting mind, for example. So um, one thing we did hear clearly in OYO, for example, is that uh, the importance of continuing ground campaigns. People said that, you know, they didn't uh, believe that you could win an election campaign on WhatsApp alone, that you still had to go out, you had to meet people, you had to talk to them, you had to convince them of your approach. So I think that, you know, it's a, what I would say, it's probably more likely a, an additional tool that can be used to, to further your reach and to further your ability to talk to people because it does offer you a new platform to spread information much faster, to arrange political rallies and things like that. Um, in Kano, uh, perhaps one of the more interesting things would be looking at, and again, this is something we haven't really done a lot of detailed research into, but something that came up in some of the discussions was around how, um, platforms like WhatsApp, but also other social media platforms were used on uh, voting days, particularly for the gubernatorial and then also for the supplementary election, uh, to discourage people from going out to vote. So perhaps saying that whilst there was violence taking place in parts of uh, Kano, uh, the LGAs where there was a supplementary election held, uh, there were also rumors that it was taking place in different parts of the, um, in the city uh, where there was actually no violence taking place. And so, uh, in that sense, it, it can have an impact on the turnout figures. Now, it, again, we have no idea how many people maybe didn't turn out to vote because of that. Um, but it's something that's really interesting and worth studying. But it's also very complicated to say definitively that I voted for a candidate because of what I saw on WhatsApp. Um, but it, it, it's certainly having an influence. And the fact, the fact that kind of all political operators now have social media teams supporting them on the campaign, I think is an indication that, uh, you know, there is a sense that there is some degree of importance to being online, uh, to being able to share your platform online and also to be able to counter narratives that are being put out against you. Uh, J Jamie, I just want to explore the Kanu incident a little bit. You, you know, we're all uh, left our tenter hooks as regards uh, the outcome of, of Kanu because the race was really close. It was neck at neck at some point. Uh, during those crunch times, what was, the, what was the effect of WhatsApp in those very dire times, those nail-biting times in Kano? What was the effect? We'd like to know. Um, yeah, well, I, I wasn't there for the uh, gubernatorial elections, but we had some research, uh, part of the research team that were there. Um, and I think that, um, again, it's trying to f kind of highlight this balance. So people were talking about how WhatsApp is almost replacing radio, uh, in places like Kano where people are able to receive a message, send it to their friends, and they can also counter it. So whilst I said that you know, there were these rumors of violence taking place in certain parts, uh, if people were there, they could quickly respond and say, no, nothing is happening here. Uh, please you know, go ahead and vote as you would normally. Uh, so there is, again, this balance of, of being a positive and a negative force. Uh, I think in Kano, what's interesting as well was the kind of use of Hausa language, which was very prominent. Um, uh, and, you know, there was lots of dialogues going on specific to the state. Uh, as you say, it was a very close race, and that was the reason for choosing both Oyo and Kano, was to try and choose some states where we were expecting a close race, because a lot of the work done about, uh, particularly about social media engagement, is often looking at kind of more authoritarian uh, areas and where there is less competition. So we wanted to try and explore that. Um, and I think that you, there was a clear kind of uh, competition in those states. And one, one of the interesting things that we saw was uh, perhaps a stronger social media support, obviously, for, for President Buhari in the state during the presidential elections that wasn't necessarily replicated during the gubernatorial ones. And um, Jamie, I was just wondering if you could place this on an alert level color. Um, how much is uh, WhatsApp and social media in general undermining democracy in a country like Nigeria? 
uh, what level would you put it on? Is this an overwhelming problem? Because really, again, we have the conventional media where factual information is still being disseminated. Um, well, I think that, like I said at the start, the real kind of emphasis here is to recognize that WhatsApp is both has many positive implications and negative implications. Uh, and what the effort is to try and do is to try and emphasize more of the positives and to reduce some of those negatives. Now, uh, some of the things that came out of research in Kano was how WhatsApp, with its fact that you only need a uh, mobile phone number to be part of uh, the platform uh, and that you don't have necessarily ide an identity on it, was offering a chance for for women from conservative households, for example, to be more engaged. And we've seen how it's being used to kind of promote political accountability, uh, that it's being used to monitor elections, you know, to do these parallel voter tabulations that some civil society organizations have been doing. So there are many positive functions. And I think that uh, it, it's very uh, important to recognize that that is the case, that it's not just all about WhatsApp and fake news, or as we like to call it, misinformation and disinformation that there are a number of positive impact, uh, impacts that WhatsApp is having. Uh, but there's also, you know, obviously, I don't need to tell most Nigerians that there is a lot of false information that's also being shared online. Mm. And I think that uh, it does pose, you know, some risks, but, you know, those risks are, uh, it's possible to, possible to mitigate against if we have, you know, I think that Nigeria has talked a little bit about having a, a data um, protection and data rights bill. I think that would be a positive step if the government was to push forward with that uh, digital literacy, uh, continued fact checking. And also, I think WhatsApp can do a few things uh, in terms of improving the application to allow users to, re to report content, uh, to uh, allow people to stay, uh, leave groups or not have to be added to groups. They have to give approval for they're added. I think then we can you know, see the negatives reduced and the positives being amplified further. For now, I think the balance is perhaps still slightly in in favor of you know, the, the negative uses. Um, but it, it's a very big danger that if we say that WhatsApp is only uh, causing problems for a democracy in Nigeria, which I don't think it is, then you miss out on all the potential uh, positive applications of the platform. All right, Jamie, uh, let, let's quickly talk about results. You know, because when, when this results started to trickle in in various polling centers, WhatsApp was a big vehicle at dispensing these results. And a lot of results were coming in on our WhatsApp pages and things like that. Uh, is this like so? How, how did this alter the dynamics of the eventual results in these two states when you look at it? Uh, I, I don't think necessarily that they altered the, the results. I mean, one thing is that um, government and even the Independent National Electoral Commission aren't really using perhaps social media uh, as well as they could. And obviously, there are challenges of doing that because it, if, if INEC is, is using uh, social media to and WhatsApp to announce results at a, a kind of lower level, say a um, ward level. Um, there is obviously the possibility that they can also be, uh, someone else can pretend to be them and, and issue them on their behalf. But I think when I'm talking about results, what we've seen people using WhatsApp for is when we're doing these parallel voter tabulations. So there were a couple of these run during the election uh, in 2019. And it at least gives an indication of whether the results being released by INEC seem to align with those results that are being produced uh, at that level. Um, where you know WhatsApp is just another, it's a, it's a platform because of the end-to-end -end encryption where people feel safer sending in pictures of their polling unit results that then can be used uh, and put into a big spreadsheet, either even by political parties, but also by civil society, to really try and map out this level of detail because, uh, as we all know, INEC hasn't yet released uh, really detailed results from the 2019 elections. Mm -hmm. We do know that WhatsApp itself is taking measures to ensure that uh, f fake news or disinformation you know, is, is uh, limited uh, to the barest minimum. But let me talk about cost, um, Jamie. In terms of cost, I suppose WhatsApp is cheaper than you know, the conventional media and other political strategies that have been employed in other elections. Uh, did cost have a role to play in the deployment of WhatsApp as against others such as maybe Twitter, um, emails, Instagram? 
Yeah, I think the platform does uh, has a number of advantages uh, in terms of getting to the kind of really low level. Um, yes, cost is low. We talked to a lot of people who said, I mean, even as, as little as a few hundred Naira can last you a month in terms of the amount of data you can use. And people have a very good knowledge of the uh, packages available, how to double your data, what times of the day you get better data. Um, and WhatsApp is very, very data light. Um, and particularly when it comes to uh, text and voice, uh, even pictures are quite easy to use. So compared to something like Instagram or Twitter, it's much, much more uh, data friendly. Uh, I think that's a, a key kind of aspect of WhatsApp. I also think its simplicity is really important. Um, it, it's essentially very similar to SMS. Uh, and with the kind of growing reduction in smartphones, it's, it's never been kind of, in terms of the cost of smartphones, it's never been kind of cheaper to get online in Nigeria. Uh, and uh, another thing I would just say about um, when we think about WhatsApp and, and its kind of impact on, online, it's also to recognize that information that's shared on WhatsApp doesn't necessarily always stay online. Uh, we talked a bit before about how you know, community leaders and, and religious figures can have a kind of big influence on these platforms, but also if they take that message and, and share it with their congregation or with their community, uh, that message can spread offline quite easily as well. And so whilst we say that you know, internet, I think the um, penetration levels is X percent in Nigeria, we should also consider that it doesn't necessarily stop there, that WhatsApp messages can shape people's views outside of an online space. And that's, again, something that we've only kind of tentatively raised as a finding in the research and something that would be worthy of more study in the future. Mm. All right, well, I'd like to say a very big thank you to you, Jamie Hitchens, uh, for talking to us about this and for throwing more light as regards this. And it's, it's a really healthy conversation, and it's something that is definitely mm -hmm. ongoing because the power of WhatsApp is mammoth. And, and, and it's I come to stay. It has come to stay. I mean, let, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, it's a new form of media. Yes. It's a new wave of media. Thanks so much once again, uh, Jamie Hitchens, uh, a consultant at AERA Consultant.